So you know the difference between being busy and being in a hurry, because there is a difference between being busy and being in a hurry. And we, most of us, many of us are busy because we live in a world where there's lots to do. Busy is something that exists outside of us. It's our schedule. Being in a hurry is a condition of our soul. It exists within us. And it's something that we have to ruthlessly eliminate from our lives. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for today and pray that you would allow us as we open your word to uh, learn from you, to listen to you carefully and to maybe change. There's some things we're gonna talk about today that are challenging and difficult for some, but really good for growth. So we give everything that's going to happen today to you and trust you that you'll meet us here and change us in Jesus' name, amen. So today we begin an eight week series on the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000 where he took a few loaves and some fish and he fed 5,000 people. If you remember in the fall, we talked about this miracle where Jesus had just experienced a tragic loss, a loss of his best friend, John the Baptist, who was murdered. He was beheaded. The disciples told Jesus what had happened to John the Baptist. Uh, Jesus decided he needed to take some time away. So he tried to go take some time away to rest his soul. And the crowds followed him. As the crowds followed him, the crowds, Jesus saw them and realized they were hungry and knew he had to feed them. And so he looked at one of his disciples and said, what are we gonna do? There's lots of people and there's no food. And the disciples said, Jesus, we can't do anything. There's nothing we can do. There's too many people, the need's too great, not much we can do to accomplish it. But then another one of the disciples looked and found a little boy who had a couple of loaves and a couple of fish. And the boy gave them to the disciple who gave them to Jesus and Jesus gave thanks to God and he broke the bread, passed the bread and the, or the crackers and the, the fish out and 5,000 men plus who knows how many women and children ate more than they needed. They collected the baskets back and the miracle was complete. But each week we're gonna break a piece off of this miracle and we're gonna talk about some principles that contribute to this entire event that's listed in all four gospels, one of the most significant miracles in all of scripture. The apostle Paul writes in the book of Romans that the world has a current that we're all born into, that Satan has a plan for your life. And he wants you to be in a hurry so that we're so hurried in our soul that we settle for a mediocre version of life and of faith because it's impossible to microwave depth. Depth happens slowly. Let me read it to you from the book of Romans. Therefore, I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, it's your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will really is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. The world has two currents, one that pulls us toward what it wants for our life. And the current moves quickly. The Holy Spirit has another current that flows in contrast, like two opposing lanes of traffic that pulls us toward the person or the people that God wants us to be. And it moves intentionally. So I don't want you to think as I open this subject up and begin to discuss this with you, that I'm trying to tell you that you can't be productive in life, that you can't even be busy in life. But what I want to show you is that it's impossible to follow faster than the person we're following. That to be a follower of Jesus with uncommon faith, we have to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our life, even though we're busy and we have to follow the example of Jesus. Now you may think it's a weird kind of a thing to start with, but really this whole miracle started with this idea and I'll read it to you. Um, and we're gonna be in the book of Matthew and throughout the next eight weeks, we're gonna jump around to the different gospels, pulling out different pieces. But um, in the very beginning, Matthew 14, 13, when Jesus heard what had happened to his friend, John the Baptist, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Now, there are two types of people in this world. There are a lot more than two. 
But I want to find out um, among you and those watching online, which of these two particular categories you happen to fall in. Uh, there are some who, when I say, and I'm going to give you both sides to this before I ask you to raise your hand, how many of you like to take naps? How many of you like to rest? How many of you look forward to these kinds of things? And the opposite side of that is, how many of you feel like napping is a waste of time, that when you're asleep, things go on that you want to be a part of, and um, you know that you would consider yourself not to be naturally bent toward these things that not particularly a napper. How many of you are, na are, are you, how many of you's, how many of you are nappers? Raise your hand. Okay. We got a bunch more, a, a higher percentage in this service than the other. How many of you are not nappers? Raise your hand. Okay. We have a smaller, slightly smaller majority. Interesting to me when you see couples that are together, one's a napper and one's not a napper. In my opinion, when a person does pre-marriage counseling, uh, one of our pastors, maybe we ought to include that question. Uh, are you a napper? Is your spouse to be a napper? Because if you got a napper and a non-napper, it's pretty stressful in a, in a relationship because the non-nappers judging the napper when they're asleep and the napper when they're napping thinks that the non-nappers pushy and it gets really bad. And it it isn't about whether you like naps or not. This isn't about your personality. It's not about your predisposition. It's about intentionally taking time away to settle your soul. Now I'm going to slur at you a little bit this morning and it's not because I'm having a stroke. I had some dental work done and they put a little temporary thing here in the back of my, like the roof of my mouth and my tongue keeps hitting it. And in the first service, I was, especially when I said several S's at the same time, I was slurring and they were looking at me going, is pastor okay? And I know that I said, I'm not having a stroke. I'll probably have one right now. And you guys will be like, he said it was just his teeth and I'll end up needing medical attention. But um, if you hear anything a little weird, it's just the dental work. You can blame my dentist and hopefully in a few weeks, it'll be all taken care of. Now, if you find yourself busy and you need a break and you need rest because you've cluttered your own life up to the point where you don't leave any margin, that's not really what I'm talking about today. What I'm talking about today is a person who has an eye toward accomplishing God's purpose in their life, who feels like that they're doing their very best to order their schedule and their family around things that are happy or pleasing to the Lord. And um, that you find yourself from time to time just really getting exhausted. That busy becomes hurry, your lines get blurred. And I get a little concerned about this subject because I think so many of us we pack our lives so full with stuff that we have no margin left over and no room to do the things that are really significant in life. And we find ourselves superficial, which is one of the worst things that we could be. And not only that, but we as parents and grandparents oftentimes cram our kids' lives so full of things that half the time they don't even wanna be doing in the first place so that they stay so busy, 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 that the busy becomes hurry and that the hurry can become sin. That the hurry can keep us from being able to connect with God, to be able to connect with the people around us. And Jesus modeled throughout his life. And you read this in the gospels over and over again. He consistently took a time out so that he could go and connect with the father to never allow his busy schedule to become a frantic and frenzied pace where his soul began to suffer. Now, Jesus does things for different reasons than we do, but he never does anything that we're not supposed to learn from. So let me show you a few things that Jesus did and did not do. Jesus rested to keep busy from becoming a hurry, but Jesus didn't rest by skipping church. I think this is interesting and I threw this in here because I have had friends, yes, friends who they say, my life is so busy that I just need to skip church on Sunday and take a little me time because, um, you know, after all, I deserve it. And, and I feel like if life is too busy for church, and I don't mean never, ever skip church, but I mean as a habit or a pattern, that life is simply too busy and priorities have gone out of whack. And, and I, I would say that Jesus went to church and you might argue with me. And if you did, I, I'd be happy to, to point you to the scripture because in Luke chapter four, the Bible says that Jesus went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up and on the Sabbath, he went to church, to the synagogue, as was Jesus' custom. So when I'm talking to you about taking some time away and taking some margin and some periods to connect with God, I'm not talking about taking time away from this. I'm talking about taking some time apart from that. And I don't know what the that is, only you know what the that is. 
But this is what Jesus did. And these are some times when he rested. Now, a weird message today, we're observing things that happened in Jesus' life. Observing some snapshots from the gospels. It is um, powerful because it's repeated, but different because it's more topical in nature. Jesus rested after exciting events. The same miracle, right after it was over, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side. And then after that, Jesus went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there on the mountainside alone. Jesus rested and took a time or a minute away because when busy becomes hurry, we miss out on the miracles. Do you think, do you feel in your life like you're hurried? Does your soul feel a little frenetic, a little frantic? Miracles happen every day. And I don't necessarily mean big M miracles. Sometimes I believe they happen, but I think that God acts and does things every single day in our lives and in people's lives around us and our kids' lives. And when we allow hurry to creep in, busy to become hurry, and our souls to become frantic, we miss the miracles that ground us in the reality that God is at work and that we're part of something bigger than we are. And so Jesus took some time away. And when Jesus took time away, he did at least three things. He thanked God. He asked God for direction, what's next? And he asked God to give him strength to be able to endure whatever it was he was facing next. Now, there were other things that Jesus did, but those three things were common in Jesus' step away to make sure that he had a rested soul. Because for us to live a generous life, we have to be a rested person. Our soul has to be at rest, even if our schedule is quite busy. Jesus rested before making big decisions. One day when Jesus went out on the mountainside to pray, he was gonna call his 12 disciples and start off his, his uh, close group of friends who he ministered with. But he, he stopped and, and went away to a mountain to spend some time with God because Jesus was modeling the fact that when we get hurried, we make bad decisions. Can anybody attest to that in their own life? Bad decisions are often made in a hurry. In a hurry, sometimes we choose to date the wrong people, to take the wrong job, to buy the wrong thing, all right? To say the wrong thing. Because in my own experience, I'm so bad at this. I feel almost like a real hypocrite talking about this because I fall into the no-nap category and the, the sometimes can get a little bit of a frantic and frenetic sort of a soul. But in my experience, when I try to make important decisions on the fly, it's almost always the wrong decision. In fact, oftentimes my first instinct, now that I know myself a little bit at 53 years old, I'm like, uh-uh, that's not what I'm supposed to do. And then I look for the next thing that comes along if I have the wisdom to pause. So Jesus was modeling the fact that our heart is deceitful above all else and we can't trust it. But when a big decision has to be made, we need to take some time away and we need to recalibrate and make sure that busy does not become hurry because when busy becomes hurry, we make bad decisions. Jesus rested after busy seasons of ministry. The apostles had come back to Jesus after they'd been out for a long period of time doing all kinds of things that were amazing, miracles and teaching. And so many people were coming and going that they didn't even have a chance to eat. And Jesus said, listen, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest for your soul and for your body. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Hurry makes us burn out quickly because God gives us the strength in our life to keep pace with a busy schedule when he's in charge of our schedule. But he does not give us the grace and the strength to deal with hurry because hurry is self-imposed. Busy exists outside and is dictated by priority and choice, sometimes has to be adjusted. Hurry exists inside. And it's a sickness of the soul that oftentimes the schedule affects. Jesus rested when he was peopled out. Have you ever been peopled out? Let's talk for just a second. 
it is just me and just you talking here. So give me a little bit of eye contact and I want you to tell me the truth. I'm not gonna ask how many of you have been peopled out. I'm gonna ask, has anybody in here never been peopled out? Has anyone said at any point in time in your life or not said, I've had a little too much people and I need a little bit of a break. I've said that from time to time. Have you said it? Just a little hand like here. Just a little, have you said it? Have you said it? Okay. Jesus got peopled out. <gasps> Pastor, you're talking about God. Yes, I am talking about God. Jesus, 100% man, 100% God, who needed a break from people. And let me explain to you the genius of the break that Jesus took and you and I need it too is that Jesus went into a house in the vicinity of Tyre and he didn't want anybody to know he was there. He needed a timeout and he needed a break, but he couldn't keep his presence a secret. And he was modeling something very important that hurry makes us unable to love. And above all else, we Christians need to be loving. And if we have allowed busy to become hurry, we can't love the people who are in our lives. And Jesus was showing his disciples and showing us that to be able to love well, sometimes we take a step back, but we never allow ourselves to fall into the trap of saying, I don't like people. Because if we do that, we're saying, you know what? I don't really care about what Jesus had to say about the way I should live my life. We don't have the option of not being people people some of us have a little harder time around people. But Jesus intentionally took a step back so that he could love well the people in his lives. Henry Nouwen has a phrase that's called sunset fatigue. And he said, when we've allowed busy to become hurry, we get to the end of the day and we get home or we sit down in a car or across a dinner table from the people who are closest to us and the ones who trust us, the ones who we should connect with the most, the ones we're the most responsible for, but yet we have allowed our schedule, our busyness to become hurriedness and our soul to become frantic. And we can't love well the people who are closest to us because we're just too much in a hurry. And I think about this and thought as a parent, I remember times when I had my boys race to do things and I didn't need them to prove one was faster than the other. I just needed to get to the next thing. I find myself oftentimes with Joy, who I love more than any other person in this entire world. When she's talking to me about something important to her, I find myself tapping my foot and asking her. Sometimes I even say it. Could you get to the point? I can't catch all the, and, and look at her and what, what's wrong with me? And Jesus was modeling to his disciples. Love is not impatient. Love is not unkind. And that if we allow busy to become hurry, we can get impatient and unkind, selfish. And it robs us of our ability to love. We can't live a generous life without being rested. We have to ruthlessly eliminate hurry. Jesus rested when he faced intimidating tasks. He withdrew about a stone's throw from beyond his disciples. This was right before his arrest and trial and crucifixion. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was modeling, connecting, taking a minute away, not allowing the busyness of the last events of his life to become hurry in his soul because hurry tempts us to take the easy way out. And the most beautiful things in life are almost always found if we're willing to take the scenic route. So Jesus modeled this over and over and over to his disciples. And I was wondering as I'm reading through the gospels, because before I just read this as connecting sort of statements or themes, 
And Jesus went to the mountainside to pray. And then something amazing happened. And then Jesus went off by himself for a while to pray. And then something incredible happened. And then Jesus slipped away. And it didn't even occur to me for years and years and years that the important part of the story wasn't the part I was emphasizing. It was the things that were going on that allowed Jesus to experience and do all of these things that I thought were so important. And you and I, I think, sometimes we fall into the current of the world. We masquerade, as the Apostle Paul said. We put on the mask of the world and we allow the current, the fast pace, based on choices we make and expectations that we either have or people impose. And it pulls us faster and faster and faster and faster and faster where we're not only busy with the wrong kinds of things, perhaps, but we've allowed busyness to become hurriedness. And hurriedness is a disease of the soul. So at the end of the time together, we're gonna to talk about this in some ways to correct this or combat this so that we can be so fully present in this moment that we can live generous lives and we can follow the example of Jesus. We're gonna have some fun doing it. Well, as you know, we are beginning 10 for 10. And I want to explain this to you real quickly because this is an important part of us becoming uh, generous people. When we talk about living a generous life, we talk about living a life of generosity with our time, with our thoughts and our heart and with our income. And um, we are going to do an exercise, a workshop, a project together for 10 weeks. And it's super simple. It is to give to the Lord through the church $10 a week for 10 weeks. If you already give faithfully to the Lord through the church, thank you for that. I would ask you to give $10 more for 10 weeks. If you sometimes give to the Lord through the church, I still would like to encourage and challenge you to give $10 per week more for 10 weeks. If you've never given anything to the Lord through the church, I wanna encourage you to begin by giving $10 a week for 10 weeks. It's called 10 for 10. Are you in? And it's because I love you. And it's a weird subject to talk about because people um, sometimes get the wrong impression of pastors in churches and say things like, um, the church just wants my money. Um, I think I, they just want something from me. They're always telling me to give. And I, I hope and trust that we know each other well enough after being together for so many years that that's just not the case that for us to invest in the things that God cares about, starting with our church family, it is an indicator of the heart, but it also changes our heart. I want us to be people of uncommon generosity, generous people in every area of our life. So much so that my two boys, 24 and 27, beginning their lives now with their jobs and my oldest son and family, Pastor Dan, the deacons and I have absolutely no benefit from what they do with their money. They go to a church in a different state. But I encourage them consistently to give generously to their church because I want more than anything else for them to be men with generous spirits who God will trust with more so that they can invest in the things that impact eternity. And if I want it for the people who are closest to me, I want the same thing for you. In the Bible, in the book of Matthew, Jesus tells us that we are the managers of the assets God's entrusted to us, not given to us, and that we're supposed to, and this is Matthew 6, 9 through 21, not just simply hoard things here on earth where we keep score and buy stuff that we think we need or want, because we can lose it, it's temporary but we store for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where nobody can steal it, it's permanent. And in verse 21, this is the point that I want to emphasize with you right now. And it's the same point that I share with my two sons and everyone else who'll listen. Where I choose to put my treasure is an indicator of where my heart is it is arguably possible to give to something without loving, but it's impossible to love something without giving. It just doesn't work. And I want your hearts to experience the blessing of generosity to the Lord. 
So we just decided to come up with an easy way to get started. 10 for 10, are you in? And this will allow you to not only experience the joy and you say, 10 bucks, what's the big deal? I will tell you, my wife can spend almost 10 bucks at Starbucks on her own. $8.62 the other day for a drink that she ordered. I don't know what all she did to it, but I have to find a cheaper date or let her pay for herself. 10 bucks is not that much, right? But what this does is it primes the pump of our heart. It puts you in a position where God can show you the joy of giving. It can unlock generosity in you that you didn't know was there. And what do you have to lose? $10. It's a small amount of money, but it's consistent. It shows faithfulness. And you can allow God to show you his faithfulness through this small token that you're giving to him. So we're gonna start this and we've tried to make it super easy for you. And uh, we have the pastor of technology and other things. Jared Matheny is one of our pastors and he wears a lot of hats. Technology is just one of them. He's come up with a way that's super simple for us to do this. And if I can figure it out, if Pastor Dan can figure it out when Jared explains it, you guys can certainly figure it out because the two of us are a little slow sometimes on the uptake. You can do this. You can do $10 the old fashioned way. You can put it in the boxes if you want to. You can do $10 on the website. You can do it through the app with PayPal or you can text to give. Yes, uh, we have text to give and we actually had loads of people come up to me after first service and tell me that they did this, started giving this way and that they were so proud. They figured it out all on their own and uh, it's just, it is just that simple. So this phone number here is going to look real familiar. Go slow because I'm going to do this while you're talking. Yes. I have to do this for joy in this service. I did it for me in the first service, yeah, but yeah, I got to do it for joy this service because she probably won't remember to do it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, this phone number is going to look familiar. Uh, this is the same phone number that you text to get our app. It's the same phone number you text if you want to share a prayer request with us. Uh, so it's 515-517-8842. And so you hear that every Sunday in our announcement videos. And uh, so that is our number there that we're going to send our text message to. Uh, we're gonna start out sending the word give and just the word give to that number. Uh, you'll receive a return text back from them asking you to opt in to text messaging uh, with this service. And again, this is just uh, us to be in compliance. We're not selling your numbers. Uh, we're not gonna spam you. Again, this is just something that we have to do to protect your number. And so you go ahead and opt into- You promise, the, you promise that you're not telling people promise. numbers, get yes. a little side Absolutely. gig going yep. on. Because if we get texts from other places asking for money, they're not gonna be happy with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, no, so this again is something we'll- It's on protect you. Your, yes, it's absolutely. You, yeah. you come and talk to me if somebody starts spamming your number. And uh, but yeah, so uh, this right here, again, that return text, that first return text will opt you in for the text messaging in this system. After that, you'll receive a text that asks you to send the amount that you want to donate. And so that would be in this case for 10 for 10, if you're stepping in at that $10. And so you just send the number 10 back to that return text. Uh, after that, you will receive a link that uh, allows you to set up your donor account. And so this is where you're gonna go in and put your name, your email address, and uh, that financial information where you want those funds to come from. And so this donor account allows us to send you a receipt. The, the system will send you a receipt after every donation, but then at the end of the year, the church will send you a, uh, a receipt, uh, the contribution statement for the entire year of anything that you donated through this process here. And so again, that's where that's set up and why that happens that way and why that needs to take place. But again, so the great thing with this, you complete everything, you click the donate button at the end, you hop back to your text messaging and you get that receipt. It's right there, it's available for you instantly to view. And the best part is there's no password, there's no login to remember. You save this phone number in your, uh, in your phone and you come back each week whenever you want to and you text uh, give and your number together. And again, it'll process all of that with the stuff that you have set up ahead of time. There's no need, again, like I said, to log in, no password to remember. And so this is something, it's super simple and it's a, a great and straightforward way to step into it. Like I said, we had loads of people that came up after first service and were excited with just how simple this process is. So I won't have to set up all the steps after the first time. Just Correct. Big, okay, yep. good deal. So I, got a, I have a problem though, because Joy just gave $100 accidentally and not 10. I didn't put the dollar. Can you give me 90 bucks? So we'll talk to Pastor Dan about okay. that. Give, see if we can. I need some change because Joy that. didn't mean to give 100 for today. She just <laughs> meant to give 10, but I'll tell her she owes. Yeah, that, we did that. So if you do have questions about this, um, I'll be outside after this service. And we do have these cards uh, printed out. You can take one of these home and uh, look at it, reference it, and go ahead and get that set up Thanks. if maybe you don't have your payment info on you right now. Thank you. Yep. Awesome. 
Some of you are going to have to look down your aisle. You know, if you're on the, on the end, and if you look like you got a, a cheap aisle, you may have to give for the whole aisle. So just, um, just look at them and go, hey, are you in 10 for 10? If they're like, uh-uh, then you, you go ahead. You, aisle captains, you go ahead and cover for the, I'm just, I'm teasing with you. Then we're going to have some fun with this. Remember, I told you at the beginning, the apostle Paul told us that there was a current of the world. He said, do not be conformed to the image of the world but be transformed. The word's metamorpho. Let something happen to you by putting yourself in a place where it can happen to you. You can be transformed into the image of Jesus to care about and love the things Jesus cares about and loves, but we have to be intentional about putting ourselves in that place. That the world has a current and the current moves quickly and the world will fill your schedule with things that are busy but not significant and turn busy to hurry where you will have a frenetic and frantic soul. Where if we're not careful, we'll settle for some mediocre, complacent version of relationship love and Christianity, faith that God never intended. And so we have to make sure we put ourselves in a spot where God can transform us. And doing that, we follow the example of Jesus. Jesus did not just recreate. Recreation and the kind of rest I'm talking about are not the same thing. When Jesus took time away, he did it with a purpose to reconnect to God, the Father, to thank God for the blessings that God had given him to thank God for who God was, to ask for direction for next steps, to ask for strength to help him do the things that God had put him in his path to do. And so we do these same things, but we have to make sure that we're not just in a hurry because we've just crammed our lives with things that just make us busy. So I wanna ask you a couple of questions. How's your soul this morning? Do you have a frenetic soul? I like that word frenetic. I'm not sure why, but I like it. Are you easily pulled in multiple directions, all with different priorities? Do you tend to overthink and overanalyze, wondering if you're currently doing what you should be doing? In its hurried state, can your soul distinguish between what's good, what's better, and what's best? Friends, I like Dr. Phil just fine, but I am not him. And this is not self-help. This is not feel good. This is not, hey, let me help make your life a little more productive so that you can accomplish your purpose. What I'm talking about is you putting yourself in a place intentionally where the Holy Spirit of God can transform you to where even though you may find yourself busy doing the things he's put before you to do, you'll never find yourself crossing the line from busy to being in a hurry. One of the most successful men I've ever known, his name was Dave. He was a senior level vice president at a corporation that you guys would all know. He'd ridden on their planes. One of the most busy people I've ever met, but never in the one time in the seven years that I knew him that I ever see him in a hurry. And I asked him what the secret was. And he said, Rick, I've trusted God to put me where he wants to put me. And I'm faithful, you gotta work hard. But he said, I trust God. I trust him with my career. I trust him with my family. I don't feel that I have to help him when it comes to choices that would require me to compromise. That I wanna be a man of faith because God's put me in a spot where I can be a man of faith. And sometimes it requires hard decisions and tough choices, but God's never left me hanging. Now that's my paraphrase, but that's what he told me. And I watched for years him travel the world but not one time, not having the time to be able to do what he felt was significant and important in his life. And he would be the very first one to tell you he didn't do it, that the Holy Spirit of God has transformed him and developed in him an uncommon faith that gave him grace in the middle of the pace. And that's what I'm talking to you about. And so I have um, a couple definitions here just to remind you and then a little acronym I'm gonna leave you with. Remember, busy is outward, but a hurry is inward. Being in a hurry is a preoccupation with self and my own life, making me unable to be present with God, myself, and other people. I can't even have clarity of purpose. I wanna encourage you to rest, not recreate. Recreate's fine, do recreation on your own. If you wanna travel, travel, that's fine. You wanna play golf, play golf, that's great. That's all fine. I'm talking about intentional times where you step away like Jesus did to connect with God for a purpose, to thank God, to ask for direction, to ask for strength. 
And I have a little acronym here, this rest. First of all is remove distractions from your life routinely. That's the R in rest. I had a conversation with my oldest son just a few weeks ago about this because there are things that are going on where he just needs to be able to think clearly and he works around a bunch of people where he can never get quiet. And so he steps away to his truck a couple of times a day and he said, dad, it's good. I got tinted windows. Nobody can see me sitting in there. And, and what I've told him is turn off the phone, turn off the radio, don't answer your texts. You need to routinely eliminate the distractions from your life because we live in a life full of distractions. Some of you, some of us, can't put our cell phones down for a minute. We're talking to somebody and we're checking our texts. We're talking to somebody, we're playing our games. We're talking to somebody and you get the, you get the picture. We intentionally distract. We call it multitasking. I'm the, I mean, I'm, I'm the worst. I can multitask. I can, I can be somewhat present in six tasks at the same time. But if I'm somewhat present in six tasks, I can't be fully present in, in any. So you have to set aside time. And I don't mean just time in your life where you take weeks away. I mean, time in your day where you routinely remove the distractions from your life. I had somebody ask me one time, well, if I'm gonna go and spend time with God, what do I take with me? Nothing. You wanna take your Bible? That's okay, right? Leave your cell phone. Don't need your headset. Don't need a friend. Routinely remove distractions. Number two, energize your mind and body. That may sound kind of new age, but that's what prayer does. Prayer re-energizes your mind and gives you strength in your body. And if you think I'm wrong, just read the gospels and see what it did for Jesus. And then you'll see what I'm talking about. Set your mind on things above. This generally takes me a minute because my mind is usually preoccupied with lots of thoughts. And they're not always the thoughts of the things above. They're the thoughts of the things that are pressing in my day. And so my time alone, when I take these little breaks in my day, and I don't mean hours, I'm talking about breaks. Eliminating the distractions is discipline. But I say, God, I need to hear from you right now. And if you don't speak loudly, I'm not gonna get it. Sometimes I tell them about my distractions because friends, sometimes the distractions in your life can be stepping stones toward this kind of connection. God, give me the strength to be able to live this day for you. Don't let me miss the opportunities that you have for me. Help me to handle the problems and difficulties the way you would. And then I just try to thank him. Thank you for being a God who wants to connect with people like me in your truck or wherever else you happen to be. And this last thing, this is just what I do. You do what you want. Is I trust that God will meet me there. So I go into it with an attitude of expectation. C.S. Lewis says, we don't take to God the person we ought to be. We take to God the person we are. And when we take ourselves as the people we are to God, not trying to convince him we're the people we ought to be, we find that he meets us there in that moment. And we can have rest in our soul. Busy won't become hurry. We'll remove ourselves from the current of this world. Put ourselves in a place where the Holy Spirit of God can transform us into a brand new person by changing everything about the way that our mind works. But we cannot ever move faster than the person that we've committed to follow. That's just getting us started here as we dive into this series because Jesus modeled this, so we have to model it. And as we work through the next seven themes, just in these short few verses in, in the scripture about this feeding of the 5,000, each week will challenge you a little bit. So take a piece, allow God to apply it and watch yourself grow. In eight weeks, you won't even be able to recognize yourself if you apply yourself just a little bit. And that's what I'm praying. Father, thank you so much for my friends.